program and access laboratory. And uh, uh, it has been uh, quite a while, uh, and he just uh, did uh, uh, defended his PhD uh, defense a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and today is uh, uh, he's going to give a talk on application of fault diagnosis to an interesting uh, case study um, on Boeing uh, uh, the, the case study that he's going to be discussing about it uh, in further detail. Uh, without further use, uh, I would uh, uh, like to invite uh, Mr. Bayes to give his talk for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karamandini, for the introduction. Share my Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Um, thank you for the introduction, as Dr. Karamandini said. As Dr. Karamandini said, uh, my name is Wendell Bates, a PhD candidate in electrical engineering under the advisory of Dr. Karamandini. And today's talk will be about events-based fault diagnosis for partially known screen event systems. So um, there's a host of different types of systems um, in the world today, especially here at North Carolina A&T. Um, we have uh, a bunch of autonomous systems where we have UAVs in the lab, we have humanoid robots, and we also have um, UGVs or autonomous car uh, projects as well. Um, however, um, as many of you know, uh, all of these different systems are prone to faults. And so uh, a fault can be defined as anything from a deviation of a system from a specified acceptable operation or an abnormal condition that can cause an element of the system to fail. And so um, they're usually uh, separated into two different uh, categories where hardware fault, hardware and software, where hardware, fa hardware fault could be um, a loose or broken wire and a software fault could be um, a coding bug. And so we need fa fault diagnosis because in spite of, you know, the mass amount of um, intelligent minds that we throw at um, system analysis uh, to improve their re reliability, faults are still unpredictable and any anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And so there are, in literature, there are ways to uh, attack fault diagnosis using redundancy, but it's not always feasible to place uh, sensors upon sensors. And so um, these are um, a couple of the developments that we've um, come up with uh, here at Access Lab and Tech Lab for concerning fault diagnosis, um, event-based fault diagnosis for unknown plant or semi-asynchronous fault diagnosis of discrete event systems, just to name a few. And so um, the case study that I'll be applying the research to uh, that I'll be talking about today concerns the Boeing 737 MAX. And so um, the Boeing 737 MAX, many of you might um, be aware of this, the history of this aircraft. In October 2018, there were unfortunately uh, 109, 189 casualties. And then not even six months later, um, another Boeing 737 MAX tragically crashed, uh, resulting in 157 casualties, uh, resulting in 346 total casualties. And so the outline of the um, rest of the 
talk today will be about modeling the Boeing 737 takeoff procedure, fault diagnosis of the Boeing partially known system that we um, derived from the model uh, simulation and then properties of the algorithm conclusion in any questions. And so we begin with modeling the Boeing 737 MAX takeoff procedure. Um, a bit of history about the Boeing 737. It was first introduced to the public in 1968. Um, it was developed to supplement the Boeing 727 on shorter routes. Uh, it's the most ordered plane in commercial history in 1987. And the latest generation, um, one of which we'll be discussing today, is the 737 MAX 7 through uh, 10, which entered service in the 2017. A point I'd like to highlight is that uh, the 737 MAX airplanes are powered by a new and improved CFM LEAP high bypass turbofan engine. And um, these are just a couple more specs regarding the, seven bo the Boeing 737 MAX. And so uh, first I want to get into a, a bit of the airplane dynamics. Um, so to describe how an aircraft moves in, in space, there are three imaginary lines that pass through um, the center of gravity of an aircraft that, um, in regards to the roll, pitch, and yaw, um, what we'll be focusing on for this talk will be the pitch, which is the motion of the aircraft along its lateral axis. And the pitch is controlled on the airplane by elevators. And so um, a bit of history behind the beginning of the story is so manufacturing companies continuously are facing constant pressure to keep up and compete with each other when it comes to building cheaper airplanes, um, mainly uh, focusing on improving the fuel efficiency. And so in 2010, Airbus, which is Boeing's main competitor, uh, pretty much socked the aviation community announcing that they had built or had developed and were building a more fuel efficient aircraft called the A320neo and their claim was that this new aircraft would burn 16 percent less fuel and they were planning on having the neo available for full commercial operation by 2016. and so in an aggressive attempt to remain competitive because so many people were interested in the uh, new A320neo. In 2014, the CEO of Boeing announced a new larger engine design. And the larger engine design, um, instead of creating a whole new airplane, uh, the larger engine design would be put on, would be based around the base model of the previous 737 um, aircraft. However, when it was fit on the old, the old base, um, base model, the new engine didn't properly clear the ground. And so it had to be moved up and forward on the wing structure. So as you can see here, it's, it's highlighted as to uh, what the engine uh, looked like on its placement on the wings. So during the initial flight test, um, the test pilots were complaining about the high pitch rate that occurred during takeoff. And so um, to add insult to injury, uh, studies show that 20% of the aviation fatalities occur during taxiing, takeoff, and the initial climb. So this was something that uh, they couldn't move forward with producing the airplane without fixing. And so uh, the reason this is so dangerous is because a high pitch rate causes the angle of attack to be too high. And so the angle of attack is, uh, the angle between the oncoming air and a reference line or where the airplane is going. And too high of an angle of attack causes the airflow across the upper surface of the wing uh, to become detached, which re uh, results in stall. In order to combat uh, this high pitch occurrence, Boeing developed the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, uh, which is MCAS for short. And so the responsibility of the air Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought I heard you. So the responsibility of the MCAS was to automatically push the nose of the plane down in order to aid the pilot in case of irregularly high uh, angle of attack was detected. 
And so typically it was, MCAS was supposed to work in the background and the pilot would really never know it's there. And so once the crashes occurred, um, Boeing 737 MAX was grounded indefinitely. Um, numerous investigations were put in place and it was found that um, uh, new, uh, among some of the failures, some of the failures that uh, caused the planes to crash was that um, the MCAS depended on a single angle of attack sensor, um, which resulted in single point failure. So there was no way for there to be any type of correction. Um, and one of the angle of attack sensors was found to differ by 20 degrees. Also, when MCAS was created, it was quote unquote hidden. And so the software and its functions weren't disclosed to the pilot in order to increase, um, decrease the time it would take for them to launch the airplane and also decrease the cost for increased pilot training requirement. And on top of that, uh, it, the MCAS information was removed from the flight crew operations manual. Um, another thing to note is that the significant increase um, for the movement of the plane's horizontal stabilizer, the MCAS, when the MCAS was active, if you were going to override it, it required more manual power from the pilot. Um, in the case of uh, the angle of the, the MCAS reading, the angle of attack sensor um, differing by 20 degrees, the, the pilot would essentially ha lose complete control of the airplane. And so there are different modes uh, for takeoff that I want to go over of an aircraft. Um, you have the runway acceleration, uh, then you go into the initial climb, and then you go into the uh, flaps up, where the uh, flaps are retracted and the landing gear is retracted. And then you have your in route climb until you reach your cruising altitude where autopilot can be turned on. And so we choose the model, in our research, we choose to model these um, different systems as discrete event systems. And so the reason being is because discrete event systems provide a high, are able to provide a model for high level behavior which is captured by a sequence of events and also represent logical system behavior in a more useful way. Also, any faults that occur in the system can be considered as abrupt changes or events in the system. And so what is an event? So an event can be any uh, specific action taken within the system, like a button press, as you can see Baby Yoda pressing the button when he's not supposed to, any observed spontaneous behavior, such as an assembly line shutting down for no apparent reason, uh, all the way to a system exceeding the maximum and minimum threshold of a continuous signal. So there are different types of discrete event system models. Uh, we have Petri nets, process algebra, and automata. We use automata in um, our modeling because it provides an intuitive and visual representation of the system that makes composition operations and analysis more manageable. So the automaton structure is described as is mathematically described as follows. Um, it's based off a tuple where X is the state space, which is the circles with numbers inside of them. The event set sigma, which is composed of uh, observable events like sensor data transfer, Excuse me, or unobservable events such as sensor damage. Um, defaults are considered unobservable events. And then you have the transition, transition relation as well as X naught, uh, which is the initial state. And so um, you also have strings, which is a sequence of one or more events that's allowed by the system's behavior. And the language is the set of all system strings, which originate um, at the, from the system's initial state, X naught. Um, a mathematical tool we use to represent the visibility of the behavior of the system is the natural projection. Natural projection can be extended from um, events to um, events and strings to the language. And also the inverse of the natural projection allows us 
to reveal any unobservable events that might have occurred within um, the system's language. And so we'll uh, begin with the model construction. Uh, so the assumption when we're getting into the model construction of the takeoff procedures that we're starting at the beginning of the runway, all standard pre-flight checks have been approved. There are no errors that have occurred before the start and the air traffic controller has approved the takeoff clearance. And so when we begin, uh, runway takeoff uh, has uh, three different, can be best described with three different stages in velocity. So V1 is the speed where takeoff should no longer be aborted. If the engine fails before the V1 velocity is reached, the pilot uh, has to abort the takeoff and the aircraft systems will immediately cancel um, any thrust and apply the brakes. So in uh, circle one, you see the runway takeoff acceleration. While we're in this mode, uh, if the engine fails, like I said, we then move to two, um, state two, and the brakes are then applied and we're in state three. If all is going well, um, we continue on to state four, which is the initial takeoff climb. And so then we get into the in route climb. So during the in route climb, the pilot has to maintain, manually maintain the proper pitch and angle of attack for a successful climb. And then upon um, a stabilized, once the climb is stabilized, the landing gear is retracted again and the wing flaps are retracted to achieve optimum lift. So when you do this, the pilot has to be aware and anticipate any sudden changes that the angle of attack. Um, might change within the angle of attack upon retracting the gear and the flaps in order to avoid stall. And then continuous pitch adjustments have to be made by the pilot, uh, whether bringing the nose up or down through um, pulling the control stick or pushing the control stick until you reach a uh, cruising altitude and then autopilot mode can be set. And so then this is our model construction of a model takeoff procedure under normal conditions. And then this is the model once the, uh, if the MCAS was introduced. And so remember the MCAS is set to active in the background after the airplane's flaps have been retracted. Upon activation, the yoke pull is deactivated in order to avoid any manual interference by the pilot uh, while the MCAS is correcting the pitch. And you can see that uh, in red with the dotted or dashed gray lines, um, due to faulty software implement implementation and incorrect angle of attack sensor data, the nose of the plane is, was immediate push immediately pushed down during takeoff. And so now that we have our model, we can go into fault diagnosis for the Boeing 737 Max. And so in the um, model that we've created, you see there are different types of faults within our system. Uh, fault events are unobservable, otherwise their diagnosis is trivial. And so we have the known portion of the system, which is we say that this is known because this is what pilots are trained on. This is what they, they're aware of. Um, anything that could go wrong during this time, they are, um, they're knowledgeable about. And then we have the unknown portion, which was introduced in, with the intention of making the system of the Boeing 737 less complex. Um, however, if you recall, this part of the um, system is unknown to the pilot. And so there are two strategies when um, attacking fault diagnosis of a partially known system. We could, uh, strategy one could be ignoring the available information and then treating the system as a completely unknown system. And so we would start from the beginning and then continue to learn the system um, throughout. Strategy two is taking advantage of the, we could take advantage of the already available information and then begin to learn the unknown portion. And so when it comes to learning, um, there are two different types of learning. There's passive learning, 
methods where a set of training data is supplied to the algorithm for model construction. Um, however, the drawback is you cannot adapt to new situations that will require new information, and it's also susceptible to missing information. In order to combat this, there's active learning techniques which continuously engage in the system and have the ability to inquire about any of the missing information. So it's more of a conversation between the algorithm uh, and the system. And so this is the contribution of the work um, where we're considering term deterministic discrete event system um, where part of the system is known and then um, the based upon the observable parts of the string generated by the entire system, uh, how do we determine a fault occurrence in the system and diagnose any faults that have occurred? And so the diagnoser would look like um, something at the that you see in the center, the middle bottom, uh, which we'll get into in just a second. And so um, the function of, functionality of the diagnoser is uh, diagnostics to provide diagnostics of the system under analysis. Using the observable behavior of the system, the diagnoser is able to reveal information about the system's current state, whether we're faulty or normal. And then upon the occurrence of an observable event in the system under analysis, the diagnoser then will update the information on the system's condition. And so now um, this step is taking into account the known part of the system. And so um, those steps are to build the diagnoser for the known part. <coughs> um, and these are some references of the literature that um, have been done on when you know the system, how to build a diagnoser. And then we get into capturing the information uh, from the known part into tabular form. And so first we uh, build the diagnoser um, for the known part using um, this algorithm. <clears throat> and then, um, like I said, we capture, we capture the known information in the tabular form. And so the information is captured into data structures that we call observation tables, which can be measured or uh, um, represented as a tuple as well, S prime, E prime, and T prime. So the rows and columns contain different strings Rows and S prime represent distinct states in the automata, and rows and S prime um, sigma minus S represent states that might be reachable um, by events from a row or state in S, S prime. And both of these are non empty prefix closed set of finite strings. And then the columns um, in E prime represent experiments where you're testing for any new states that might exist. And E prime is compo composed of non-empty suffix closed set of finite strings. And so uh, first we use the, we use L hat, which is the um, minimum length of the events it takes to cover all states in, um, the diagnoser. And so for this particular diagnoser that's been built, the length is four. And then um, that we then begin to fill, fill the table. And so uh, with the observation table, two important characteristics I want to note are um, consistency and closeness. So consistency. Um, exist if there are two if there are two rows in s prime that are the same but no concatenation of any event um, to the end of the string results in a new a new state um, then the table is consistent if it does then you add that um, event to the set e prime and then continue to construct your table and fill it out according. And so consistency ensures that the automaton we're representing is deterministic. And then for closeness, the table is closed if and only if there's no um, 
no rho and sigma s prime sigma minus s prime that is not in s prime if there is then that row needs to be moved to s uh, s prime and then the table should be extended accordingly and so closeness ensures that all possible trans transitions to all existing states exist and so once we uh, capture the information we then begin to fill the table so because the table is so huge, this one in S prime alone creates 780 rows. Um, I will uh, go over uh, reduction in a second. And so now the next part, once we have the known information, we built our table, we've constructed the table based on the known, part, known information, we then go to learning the unknown part of building the diagnosis. And so the rest of the diagnoser structure is as such also represented as a tuple where Q represents the diagnoser states, QDK is the known diagnoser states, QDU is the unknown diagnoser states. You have your event set, um, the diagnoser's transition rules, the output function, and Q0, which represents the initial state. And so in order to um, begin this, when we get into the active learning part of learning the unknown information, we make queries to an oracle. And two queries are membership queries. Does a particular string exist in the projection of the language of the system? And is the string faulty? And then we have equivalence queries, which says, does the language of our diagnoser equal the projected language of the system under analysis? If it doesn't, then the oracle provides a counterexample that exists within a symmetrical difference between the languages. And so um, for the unknown part of the information, we um, the mapping function is a little different. So <clears throat> when you know the information and have uh, access to a system, you're able to tell what you're able to provide that state information. In this case, we don't have that state information. We just have the uh, whether or not the event occurred. And so all we can do is label whether or not those events are faulty. And so if the, so instead of a number, we represent the quote unquote state information with a star, uh, which signifies that the state is unknown. And um, if the system is, if the string is normal, um, then the, that no fault has occurred within the inverse projection of the string. And so if the inverse projection of the string um, provides uh, faulty labels or faults in all strings, then the label will then be fault. Uh, will be represented by an F, FI, whichever fault has occurred. And then if we're not sure if the inverse projection uh, provides a string that's non-faulty and a string that's faulty, uh, then we call that uh, ambiguous. And that's represented by an A. And so this is the algorithm that we use in the algorithm flowchart. So the table we constructed for the known part of V prime is set to V1. We then construct um, the zero sets, which I will go over in just a second, and then revise V1. And then we check for consistency. If the system is not, if we find that it's not consistent, the table is not consistent, we make the table consistent, we check for closeness. If it's not closed, we check or we make the table closed. And then um, if it is consistent and closed, we then construct an automata. We ask um, about, we ask the Oracle concerning equivalence query of the language. And then if the Oracle says no, the languages are not equivalent it will provide a counterexample, and you will then check for consistency and closeness again until you construct a language equivalent automata and that will be your 
a complete diagnosis. And so what I was talking about earlier, because the tables were so big, um, a way that to reduce it simply for um, visualization purposes is any row, um, all the rows that are zero, um, you can you can somewhat ignore after after we get into the z the zero row sets. So the zero element sets um, consist of z, zm, and z counterexample. So we we don't need to look because we already have the known information. We don't need to look at anything we already have. We only need to focus on rows that are zero. And so Z is the set of all zero elements within the table. And then ZM um, is constructed. We ask the oracle, do these exist in the unknown portion? And so ZM are the strings that exist in the unknown portion. And then Z counterexample is the shortest string in ZM. And we use that to continue uh, learning information about the unknowns. And so here you can see in B1 uh, from the system under assessment, AAB, AAAB was found to exist as well as AAABB and AAABD. And then those were those, that information was changed. So in B2, you can see row AAAB is now um, showing a star as well as the label which is ambiguous one. And then um, AAABB is added as a counterexample, and then the table is continuously extended. And so throughout the algorithm, we continue to check for consistency and closeness until we reach a final um, consistent and closed uh, observation table that allows us to create our diagnosis our final diagnoser. And then from the table, we use these equations to then build um, a complete diagnoser ready to assess the system under, uh, under test. And so a uh, simulation of how this works is, so on initial takeoff, we're on the runway, we're entering takeoff acceleration, no engine failures have occurred, so the pilot begins to uh, pull back on the control stick. We begin our initial takeoff climb. So we're still normal, as you can see in the diagnosis on the bottom right. We then get into flaps up. And then um, we start our in route climb. However, uh, in the case that the MCAS was working in the background, um, the plane would immediately start to pitch down. And so the pilot's initial reaction would be to pull back on the control stick in order to make the plane pitch up. The plane would not respond and would continue pitching down. And as you can see, the diagnoser shows that upon that event or occurrence that the system would be faulty. And so we believe that this is a tool that could be used um, in conjunction with other safety requirements in order to potentially save lives um, because the pilots were unable to know what was going on. And so um, a very important property of the diagnoser is diagnosability. Um, so uh, in the top right, is the equation for diagnos FI diagnosability if you have access to the system. But when you don't, we, we have come up with a sufficient condition that says if you have no cycle of ambiguous, ambiguous states within your diagnoser, then you can say that that system is um, diagnosable. So for the system we built for the Boeing 737 MAX, um, diagnoser, it is both F1 diagnosable and F2 diagnosable. An example of a diagnoser that would 
um, the undiagnosable for a fault is um, the example I'm showing here. And if you can see the red dashed lines, that there's a cycle of ambiguous two uh, states. So the system is not diagnosable for uh, fault two. But since there are no cycles of um, ambiguous one states, the system is F1 diagnosable. And so the properties of the developed algorithm is we've developed a novel technique to construct a diagnoser for a partially known system. We're able to capture the information from the diagnoser corresponding to the known part in tabular form. We utilize active learning to discover the unknown part. The algorithms uh, terminate in a finite number of iteration, iterations. We've derived the condition to verify diagnosability and obtain an upper bound for a diagnosis. Uh, a fault. And so in conclusion, uh, de we've developed a model for the takeoff procedure for an aircraft, uh, specifically speaking the Boeing 737 MAX. We developed an ag algorithm for the construction of a diagnoser when it's applied to a partially known system, derived the condition to verify diagnosability, and we've, uh, as you've seen, we've applied the technique successfully um, to a constructive diagnoser for a Boeing 737 MAX case study. And these are uh, publications that I have finished or am also currently working on. And a special thank you and acknowledgement again to Dr. Karen Medini, Dr. Amari Flar, my friends and colleagues at Access Tech Lab, Labs, the Air Force Research Laboratory, and Department of Defense. Any questions? That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Thank you, Vandal. And it was so much interesting uh, to see how uh, you're up, uh, you were able to apply the develop theory and explain it in such a nice way, being applied to a really interesting case study. Uh, and that's uh, that was, I know how much challenging it was, but that was, you did, uh, you did it really great. Thank you. So, any question to Wendell? Come on. I mean, it's, it, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question, but I'm going to wait for. Uh, Mr. Bates, Mr. Bates. Yes. I have a quick question. Um, so I've read that um, uh, certain systems of natural mathematical languages can either be uh, complete and consistent. Um, how do you how do you prevent an explosion of sort of statements or rules when you um, decide on the completeness and closeness of your uh, of your you know, language set there. So let me go back. Make sure. So your question is, when you say explosion, are you saying how do you how do you determine if it's like finite and not the table is just not going to blow up or like continue continuously checking for uh, I guess consistency and closeness? Yeah, I was a little unclear on that process. Particularly, there was one statement where you said um, that. Uh, if the table wasn't complete or the language set wasn't complete, you needed to alter it so that uh, it was indeed complete. And I was curious as to how you did that. Okay, so I, if if I said that, I misspoke. So what I what I meant by so completeness, how we're defining it is if the table is consistent and closed, so not the language. So because the language or the 
we're assuming that the um, systems that we're diagnosing are finite, the states are finite. So that, that would give us um, eventually the, um, the algorithm would have to end because you, you'd either find no other events that would lead to other states uh-huh. or um, the table would be completely filled uh, with the states that exist. Yeah, that was a great answer to question. Thank you very much. All right, no problem. Thank you. And I think along with the same line of question, you may want to comment on the termination of the algorithm. If you go to the algorithm, you have a bunch of loops that are going uh, circling back to. Um, closeness, consistency, and counterexample. So would you like also comment on the uh, uh, termination, which basically is equivalent to say that you won't face with the state explosion or uh, explosion of your uh, uh, table that you have? Right. So the because of, because of the loops, um, eventually, you're, are you referring to when we construct, you have a, com so every time we have a complete table, consistency and consistent and closed, um, we build a diag, we build an automaton from that table or diagnoser in this case. And the diagnoser has to check, has to then check with the Oracle and say, are we language equivalent? And so the inner loops, will continue for consistency and closeness um which will eventually eventually create a complete table will then ask the oracle is this language equivalent if the if it's not the oracle provides a counter example and then we check for consistency and closeness again and then um this one if we've reached the number of states or we're language equivalent the algorithm will stop. So that prevents you from exploding as well. Um, I don't know whether you have it or not. Uh, uh, can you tell uh, with how many queries the unknown part of uh, Boeing case study was uh, uh, the, was constructed and was diagnosed. No, I don't have that information right now. But I can, I can once, I can run it, and then if if that information, if anyone wants that information, I can provide that. And I think. <laughs> but presumably, it's not that much because. Uh, it's kind of the active learning is uh, trying to uh, minimize the number of queries and try to take advantage of the information it does have and only goes and make queries to the Oracle, uh, which uh, uh, kind of is trying to make it minimized. So, and in that case, can you also make comment on the Oracle, what the Oracle looks like here? Like the real world sense of what an Oracle would. Yes, in this case a study that you explain what uh, what the oracle would look like. So in this in this case study, the oracle could be an expert, um, so software or electrical engineer or any any aeronautical engineer uh, that is um, that has sufficient knowledge about the Boeing seven thirty seven that the pilot might not have. Um, there are also cases where um, it could be uh, like an autonomous build where the um, information is, uh, I guess, pinged to the control tower as queries, and the um, control tower is able to answer answer these queries as well. But um, in this case, specifically for Boeing, we're assuming that there's an expert available. Okay. 
Great. Is there any other question from Wendy? Okay, while you are thinking about question, let me also announce next week uh, presenter is Professor uh, Cynthia Rudin uh, from Duke, uh, who is in the Department of uh, Computer Science. A any other question uh, from uh, Wendy? Okay. With Hello, the this is Tommy from uh, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, uh, for your great presentation. Uh, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, actually, um, you use the automata uh, theory and language theory for uh, uh, designing your uh, diagnoser and also for uh, uh, for actively learn the unknown part of the system. My question is that uh, is it um, or have you searched about uh, any methods, machine learning methods uh, for uh, to learn or actively learn uh, such a system? The, your question was, have I uh, looked into machine learning for, um, uh, for automata uh, learning? Uh, for learning the aspect of the system. I'm, could, could you type it in the because I'm having just a little trouble. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you a yeah, little bit. Question is, uh, um, what about machine learning methods uh, to learn uh, about the unknown information of the system? Uh, have you researched about that? Or is it possible to use machine learning methods for, for it? I have not I have not researched in depth. I am I am aware of methods that exist, but I haven't I haven't looked into them. Um, like and, and to see to see and apply what uh, how how they how they would go about it during uh, for automata learning. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> There is no question. We're gonna thank Wendell again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, uh, great. Presentation. Thank you, Wendell. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.